Welcome everybody in today's seminar. Today we have a pleasure to have Maciek Majnowski uh, from ETH Zurich. Uh, so I must say it's a, uh, fun, uh, a bit funny situation for me because I know Maciek for almost 10 years, like since uh, he, uh, he was a, a, a student in high school, like we were like participating in some competition and like yeah, Magic was participating in it and I was his supervisor at the time. So already uh, from that time, I remember Ma Magic as a very uh, good student. I was thinking actually that he will be a theoretician. He had extraordinary skills, I must say, already at this young age. Uh, but it so happened that he went into experimental physics. So, so Magic studied in Oxford. Uh, he did his undergrad there, uh, ended up doing a uh, master thesis in uh, cold ions, and then uh, he moved to ETH when he's continuing working on this topic. Um, so it's not going to be, I guess, a theory talk. I mean, which is good because we do work on quantum info, quantum computing, but it's good to, to have some handle on what is actually going on in those devices. So, so today, Magic hopefully will tell us something about that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully I can, um, while I'm an experimentalist, I can hopefully still uh, look at everything with the eye of a, a theoretician. And so hopefully you will understand what I'm talking about. Um, so I tried to create like a sort of very, basic talk about what we do in trapped ions in uh, experiments. Um, and so feel, I don't have so much content, so feel free to interrupt and ask questions if anything is unclear, everything should be clear. And what I want to cover is both the foundations of the field and what happened there in the last 10 years or in the last few years and where the field is headed. Um, and to set some context, this is a picture. Uh, can you guys actually see my mouse? Yeah. So this is a picture of a sort of standard old style ion trap. And what you actually see here in the middle is a single trap ion. So that is a qubit. It's one of the few qubits that you can actually see with your naked eye. So I will discuss this project of making a trapped ion quantum computer in terms of the three pillars. So the first pillar is ion trapping, you know, how we get the qubits. How, then I will talk about how we read them out and how we manipulate them, how we do logic gates. And in each of these, I will want to focus on two main things. The first question I want you to come out knowing the answer to is what's the physics of this process? So how do we assemble qubits? How do we read out qubits? And how do we do logic gates? And then the second thing is how well we can do it. And because Quantum computers are supposed to be faster than classical computers at some tasks. We have to ask ourselves also a hard question of how fast are those operations? How fast is the readout and how fast are the logic gates? Um, but of course, temples are not bay, uh, built made out of just of pillars. There's a lot of uh, other stuff we need to have to make it into a quantum computer. And so I will discuss some things we need to put on top of these things to make a useful device. And in particular, I will talk about our work. So my work on integrated optics. Uh, and I will talk about what are the scalability challenges um, uh, for the whole field as uh, some highlights. So the first pillar is the ion trapping. So this is again the picture of a single trapped ion. And you know, since we're physicists, we sort of abstract this away into basically a single ion trapped in a three-dimensional harmonic potential, right? So this particle is trapped. So you have to basically imagine that there are some electrodes here and we apply some voltages to these electrodes to create a confining potential. Um, however, there's a problem. And the problem is the Laplace equation, which says that you cannot with static voltages or we, you cannot create a 3D confining potential. So every time you try to put some higher voltage on the side and a lower voltage in the middle, you end up creating something like a saddle potential. So an ion is confined in one direction 
and anti-confined in another. So what's the so how can you actually trap an ion electrically? Well, the trick that uh, the field uses is known as the pole trap. Um, it looks like this. So the question is, how can we trap a particle in the middle of a saddle like this? And the answer is you can rotate a saddle. So this is a video. If you rotate the saddle at the exact right speed, you can create a confining potential, right? Because every time the ion is about to escape in one direction, you sort of rotate the field to bring it back. But the rotation speed needs to be correct and so on. So that's the principle. Now, we don't actually rotate our ion traps, though we could. Um, instead, we use oscillating voltages. So typically, when you see a trap like this, there will be some voltages to uh, some metal pieces to which we just apply some voltage and some other ones where we apply an oscillating voltage. And this is maybe like the main technical complication with making ion traps. OK, so this is like an old style of an ion trap where there are big electrodes and um, a few ions. The modern style for quantum information is traps that look like this. So here is a picture of like a microfabricated chip, which has hundreds of electrodes on it. And this is not a photo, of course. This is just like a blown up image of ions above it. But basically, with modern microfabrication techniques, you can squeeze this whole thing. You get hundreds of electrodes. You get individual control over voltages of each ion, maybe even. Um, and people typically work with 1D strings of up to 100 ions in such traps. And the typical scaling uh, of space is 1 to 10 microns. So um, if you are used to at all to neutral atom experiments like tweezer arrays or lattices, one big difference is the lifetimes, right? So in a lattice experiment, they might load the atoms, do something, and then they lose them. Uh, whereas we have generally very long lifetimes, maybe even infinite lifetimes. We trap the ions and then they stay there. Um, and this is because of two things. First of all, we can do readout, which I will talk about later, which doesn't kick them out. And the second thing is that the traps are really deep compared to optical potentials that you get in tweezer experiments. So that's why uh, when you, the vacuum is good, the lifetime is good. So um, the geometry we work in is always a one-dimensional string, really. Um, it's not the, so you can put more ions in a trap, uh, and then you get create a cloud, which maybe looks like this. So new ions start piling up on the side. But this is not good for quantum information in general because these ions on the sides, they have a lot of um, motion from this oscillating trap. And it's hard to address them individually. They have extra sources of decoherence and so on. It's possible, but uh, people generally don't go that way. Uh, people work with clouds, however, for other applications like uh, atomic clocks. OK, so now that we have our ions, um, we have to encode the qubit, right? And we encode it with ele in electronic energy levels. Uh, so if you, it basically, you can think of it as a hydrogen atom. So a hydrogen, so an atom will have um, many different energy levels. And uh, some of these energy levels will be suitable for encoding quantum information and some of them not. So for example, if you look at this calcium ion energy level diagram, you see that there is this ground state then there is this excited state, which has a seven nanoseconds lifetime. So this is not a good place to hold quantum information because if you create a superposition of the S and P, seven nanoseconds later, it's all decohered. Um, however, there are some other states which li live for longer, right? So for example, this D state here, the transition from D to S is dipole forbidden. So it actually takes a very long time. So if you prepare this qubit here, it's uh, stays for one second. Uh, and that's a potentially a good place to encode quantum information. So we can say that one of these states is zero, one of these states is one. Um, and uh, the qubit T1 time would be like a second. And the spacing between those energy levels is, um, require, is in hundreds of terahertz, which corresponds to laser frequencies. So that's why we call this type of encoding an optical qubit. Uh, may I ask something? 
Uh, yes. So when you talk about this lifetime, like I, this clearly depends on the environment, right? So when you say specific numbers, so you mean like inside the uh, trap, like you shown us, or something? Well, no, actually, it doesn't really. Um, mm -hmm. So if you are working in vacuum where there are no collisions with background gas, mm -hmm. um, this you know this is it's pretty going to be a second. Basically, if you because if you think of like uh, radiation from outside, it tends to be in microwave frequencies, which are not resonant with any transition. So the only thing that can really decohere is a la is some optical field which can which is exactly resonant with some transition. If you have collisions, it's a bit more complicated because there can be a collision which maybe excites causes some transition from here to somewhere up. Um, but in typical uh, vacuum environments even low vacuum this is not at all happening so this is really the lifetime okay cool <clears throat> but thanks for the question it's very nice. thank you uh, so the other uh, type of encoding that we often use is to find two levels which are very close together so for example some atoms they have a hyper fine structure and there because of you know like einstein equations when the spacing of energy is very low the lifetime is basically infinite um so we can pick two ground state levels and we can call them zero and one states now there is no laser that addresses them um so we can either address them with microwaves like they do in superconducting systems or with raman transitions that means a laser going you know from here up here and down here uh, <clears throat> And this we call a hyperfine qubit. And nowadays it's generally the most high fidelity way of encoding quantum information uh, because it really doesn't decay at all. Like I, the lifetime of this is really like thousands of years or something. Um, why is that compared to the other scheme? Yeah, so if you think of like, if you think back to like um, when you study lasers, uh, in um, undergraduate, there are those um, equations, or, or maybe if you think of Fermi Golden Rule, you can think of like the decay rate from one level to another. And that depends on the density of states, which is inversely proportional to omega cubed. So if you basically have very short splittings, like in gigahertz, the, this is the lifetime that goes to very high numbers. Thanks. So the density of states, really. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, any other questions at this point? So now I will talk about the second pillar, which is qubit readout. So um, suppose that we prepare some superposition of these zero and one in the optical qubit. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna shine a laser which is resonant with this transition from zero up to P to this short-lived state. <clears throat> now, what's going to happen? If the qubit is in state zero, it will get excited and then immediately decay. And then excited again and immediately decay and so on. So the electron will like cycle between those two levels, constantly emitting photons. And however, if the electron is here in state one, it doesn't see this laser essentially because it's so, so far off resonant. So nothing happens. So the scheme for this detection is basically that we shine a laser from the side on our ion. And then if the ion is in state zero, it starts fluorescing. And then we collect the, the fluorescence with some lens and put it on a detector on, on a camera. And so if I really prepare a superposition of zero and one, and then I take an image with a camera, half of the time I will see this bright ion, and half of the time I will see a dark ion. And then basically in practice, we don't use cameras as usually, we just use some photomultipliers. So this is what happens if you open a photomultiplier for a certain amount of time. This is actually from my experiment. So we basically say, oh, if we saw zero or one or two or three or four or five photons, that means the ion is bright, so state zero. And if we saw six or more photons, we say the state is dark, so one. And this really implements like a very good projective measurement. Um, 
you know, it's really easy and really not a problem. In, um, if we were like a superconducting qubit experiment, we would say that we have a quantum non-demolition measurement and so on. Um, so this is, um, this is one of the good things about ions. They're very easy to projectively measure. Uh, can I ask something about this? Measure? Yes. So, okay, it will be, okay, maybe a bit uh, technical. So, uh, okay, I understand that this physical process, when you repeat it many times, like you will have, like according to the Born rule, you will be able like to say like, okay, like when you average over many experiments, you, uh, you, you, you will get the statistics. Well Actually, right. it's a single shot measurement here. So what happens okay. is that the first photon that you send uh, either gets absorbed or not. Yeah. And so basically, already the first or the second photon does the measurement of zero or one. And then the next photons just amplify it. So if we're already in zero, we get more photons. And if we're in one, then we get none. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure, sure. So then. This is then uh, a single shot thing. So in a, and then you, so, so basically also like after this, let's say after you see the, the bright spot, you are sort of certain that this qubit in the, is in the state zero. Yes, yes. I see, I see. Okay, so it's like a proper like- It's a proper people... projective measurement. So afterwards, for example, you can do another measurement um, and it will really all match up with what you're supposed to see. Sure, and like for example, like also like when people do, I mean, okay, like okay, I don't want to, uh, like so, but in principle, like if you were to do teleportation stuff like that with this kind of measurements, it's it's it's, go, it's gonna work. You can do adaptive computation. As yes, I will actually cool. show you some results later about that. Yeah. Oh, ah, cool. So no no strings attached to the measurement. It really is what it says. Mm -hmm. So I can show you actually some state of the art results about qubit measurements in trapped ions. So already 10 years ago, there was this paper from Oxford with 99.99% fidelity measurement of four ions spaced 14 microns apart. The measurement time is 400 microseconds, which is not super short, but actually the nice thing is that it's really parallel, right? So if you, if you did this measurement with 100 ions and you had a big camera, you would also achieve this similar fidelity in a similar time if you wanted to measure all of them at once. Yeah. So can I ask? So like, is it so the the fidelity doesn't scale with the system? You mean the fidelity of measurement, right? Or yeah. So there are some complications if you don't want to measure everything in parallel. Yeah. But if you just want to measure all the qubits at once, it mm -hmm. it's just basically the same the, regardless of the system size. Sure, as sure, long as you can resolve them individually on a camera. So they need to be far away from each other. They can't be within the diffraction limit. Right, right. Uh, okay, uh, so, but by parallel, you don't mean like in the, uh, they're like, okay, it's, uh, it's a, like a technical thing, but you can, so you are not only looking on, uh, you're talking on basically like combined measurement on four qubits, not for individual measurement. So if we do the measurement like this with a camera, we get four individual outcomes for each qubit telling us if this particular qubit is in state zero or one. I see. I see. So you don't get then, uh, because in principle, you would have like uh, 16 out uh, possible uh, outcomes, right? Like if you would like have them. So it's, it's the former then. So, I mean, the, the possible outcomes are two to the four. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks. So really this, this time of the measurement is really limited by how many photons you collect, right? So if you really max it out, there was this paper recently from Duke where they do the measurement in 11 microseconds with decent fidelity by really, you know, having a good single photon detector and a big lens basically. Um, and then a nice recent paper from NIST is also doing this in an integrated fashion. So what they managed to do is they have a single photon detector integrated in the trap and when they want to detect the state of a qubit, maybe they take an ion from here, they move it above the detector, then they shine their fluorescence laser, look for clicks, and then they can bring it back. Um, and this, they also managed to do with decent fidelity and decent time, and it can only get better when they, make, when they get better at making those detectors. <laughs> 
uh, I have a like yeah. practical question. So, like, uh, how do you specify uh, when do you decide to like uh, say that the state was one? Right, because this is like a lack of clicks. So you need to. I imagine you need to wait some time, and you say after this time I didn't see any photons. Yeah. Then this is the one. Yeah. Right? So, so in, an, how is it in the non-adaptive fashion, we basically select the time, and we say if we didn't see any photons or we saw less than this number of photons in this time, then we say we are one with probability ninety-nine point ninety-nine percent. Um, but you know there are like um, you can also have some adaptive schemes that basically um, start collecting photons and then once you have enough photons to really know to you know your answer up to some precision then you stop the measurement and stop wasting time and this is also something that um, actually I'm not sure if it's been done I think it's been done but I'm not hundred percent sure uh, right and the, those numbers you give here, those fidelities, this means just like the probability of error for a single qubit, or is this this? Yeah, so this is an average of the probability that um, one is accidentally labeled as zero and that the zero is accidentally labeled as one. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. For a single qubit, yeah. And uh, so they are like, uh, in practice, they are like highly asymmetric. Uh, those two probably they are symmetric. They are. Um, there is usually some slight asymmetry, but it's tiny. Um, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions about uh, measurement before we move move on to logic gates? I like all the questions so far, so keep them coming. So single. So logic gates is the last pillar and the first part of this pillar is the single qubit logic gates and this is very familiar I think from other platforms so whenever you have a qubit you drive it on resonance with a laser or with a microwave drive depending on the type of qubit you have and this is for example what we normally get in our lab so we get some rabi flops so basically after five microseconds the state is coherently transferred from zero to one and if I drive it instead for you know 2.5 microseconds, we create an equal superposition of zero and one. Um, and by adjusting the time and the phase of this drive, we can drive any x and y rotation. Um, yeah. And then we can do z rotations as, you know, um, combi either as combinations of x and y, or we can do them with, we, usually people do them with virtual phase updates. Uh, so actually, I should mention that there was a paper from IBM about uh, using virtual Z gates a couple of years ago, which gained a lot of traction. But I believe trapped ion people were doing it already in the previous millennium. But what is virtual Z gate? So a virtual Z gate is when you, your algorithm says you should do a Z gate, but instead you just update the phase of the pulse that follows it. Mm -hmm. And that is equivalent. And basically that means like all the Z gates have zero time and they take zero, um, they have zero error in this, uh, essentially. Okay. These are like tricky things because like I under, or, or the Z gates or also the like uh, diagonal in the Z basis. Also what? Also diagonal in the Z basis gates or not. Um, I, I imagine you could do similar stuff. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I think this is just basically this trick that like if you have a Z followed by an X, that's equivalent of having just an X with a different phase, you know. Mm -hmm. And okay. basically, so you never you never do the Z. Okay, but there is one more gate that is in one more single qubit gate that's important. So X, Y, Z, and does anyone know what the last one is? You can have multiple ones like P. Maybe P. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, so, okay, it's X rotation and Z rotation, so they can create any of these T's and so on. What I had in mind is this gate, is the identity gate. So, of course, I'm a bit messing with you because, you know, <laughs> it can be done from other things, but the point is that 
you want to have no error when you do nothing, right? And you can have a, a good, like since in trap finals, most of the errors are self-inflicted. So our control causes errors. We want to have, um, that when we do nothing, we want to have a good fidelity. And our qubits typically decohere just by magnetic field noise. And so um, you basically have this thing called the T2 time, which sort of limits the fidelity of, uh, of doing nothing. <laughs> um, and the way we typically tackle this is that we enclose our experiments in big metal boxes with mu metal and copper and everything to, uh, <laughs> to shield them from magnetic field noise. And that, that's how we do our identity gate. Well, <laughs> so now the nice thing about single qubit gates in trap tiles is that people don't think about them very much because they're very good. So the state of the art have 99, have one part in a million error in single qubit operations, which is, you know, really hard to measure in the first place. And this T2 time, which is the, you know, the time for which you can do nothing and still uh, have uh, the same thing at the end. Uh, there was a recent paper from Sheng Zhang which measures over one hour of coherence time for a single qubit. So I think it's safe to say that on the single qubit side, we're sorted for now. So this is the average fidelity, yes? Like from randomized benchmarking or something? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The more interesting story is in the two cube. Oh, sorry, case. sorry. Yeah? But like uh, you, you gave the, the time, but like how much is it compared to the time required to the to set the gate? Yeah, so I mean you see that the gate scales is ah, 10 I, see. Sorry, it's in the plot. I mean it depends, but 10 to 100. So two qubit gates, as I'll show, are in the 10 to 100 microsecond range. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's it's enough, yeah. <laughs> So in order to do two qubit gates, we use coupling to motion. So I want to explain that in a little bit more detail. So previously, we we're just driving the qubit on resonance. And now the question is, what happens if we detune our laser away from the qubit frequency? So you might think that nothing happens. Okay, we get some off-resonant Rabi flops and then nothing. But actually that's not the case because we, our ions are trapped in this harmonic well. So we think of it as a system which is a qubit Tra coupled to harmonic oscillators. And there is three harmonic oscillator modes per ion. And so if our frequency of the laser, for example, equals omega zero plus omega, which is the spacing of the harmonic oscillator, we will do a transition where we simultaneously drive the spin and then also excite the harmonic oscillator. So what this looks like in the lab in practice is that is the following. So if I scan the laser frequency versus the qubit frequency, what I see in the center is that I drive Rabi flops, right? So this is a Hamiltonian, which looks like sigma plus and sigma minus. But then there are those symmetrically spaced peaks on the left and right. So for example, on the left, I have a transition where I excite the spin and I de-excite the harmonic oscillator. So the Hamiltonian for this is sigma plus and A. And then there is a Hermitian conjugate there. And the symmetric peak on the right is when I excite the spin, so sigma plus, and then I excite the harmonic oscillator, so A dagger. And there is three peaks. For a single ion, there'll be three peaks on the side, right? One, two, three, and one, two, three. And for N ions, there'll be three N of them. So the way we use this motion to do gates is via something called the spin-dependent force. So there's, um, this is a little bit harder to explain, but hopefully I make a reason, give you some intuition. So the question is what would happen if we applied these two drives, the blue and the red one simultaneously, okay? So simultaneously drive on the left sideband and on the right sideband. So if I add up those two terms, I get the following Hamiltonian. There'll be omega, sigma plus, sigma minus, A plus A dagger. Okay, so sigma plus plus sigma minus is, looks like sigma x. And a plus a dagger, if you remember your quantum optics, that looks like a position operator. Right? So now the intuition is like this. If you consider like Hamiltonian to be, you know, the energy, 
then and sigma x has two eigenstates plus and minus so the plus eigen so if i plot the energy versus position the plus eigenstate sees an energy which grows with x and the minus eigenstate state sees the energy which decreases with x so if i now so this will create a different force a force that pushes minus to the right and the plus to the left so literally if i prepare a qubit in state zero and i apply this drive of the red and blue side bond simultaneously what will happen is that i will create an entangled state where minus is on the left and plus is on the right and that's what we call the spin dependent force does that kind of this make last sense? Uh, moment i got lost uh, like yeah you had a single qubit now you you so i'm still talking just qubit. about a single qubit Sorry. Uh, so I, I will get to the two qubits in a moment but basically for a single qubit this drive will uh create an entangled state like a cat state you may think where plus is on the one direction and the minus is in another direction ah, but entangled state of this of this harmonic oscillator and yeah, yeah okay okay so it's right. an entangled state of the spin and motion yeah, yeah sure um that's the general intuition and you know by di this is just displacing it like one way but if we tune the detuning or phase we can do any trajectory we can displace minus in the loop and then the plus will always go in the opposite loop so now how do we do use it to make two qubit gates well, suppose that I make, want to make a gate between, I don't know, ion four and ion eight in this chain. I aim one laser, one bichromatic laser beam at ion four and one at ion eight. And this creates a Hamiltonian, which is again, the spin dependent force, but now the force depends on the value of both spin, right? So if you think about the eigenstates of this, there will be the eigenstate plus plus, which gets displaced in one direction the eigenstate minus minus which gets displaced in another direction and then there is plus minus and minus plus and nothing happens to them and so the way we can do the gate now is we can do this gate and we do this whole loop such that everything comes back to origin and so there is now no more spin motion entanglement but the plus plus and minus minus will have picked up a berry phase associated with this loop so at the end of the process, plus plus and plus minus get a phase, for example, i, that depends on the size of this loop. And the other states don't pick up any phase. And that turns out to be a maximally entangling gate. So this is actually known as a moment Sorensen gate proposed in the 1999. Uh, <clears throat> here's a simulation for my experiment. So now if you think about this process in a computational basis, if you start with a state zero, zero, and then you run it for a certain time until you close the loop. And when you close this loop, the final state is zero, zero plus I one, one, i.e. a maximally entangled state of two ions. And the nice thing about this process is that we can target any two ions, right? And we can do a gate between ion four and ion eight or ion six and ion seven, not just the nearest neighbors. So yeah, I mean, if you, if it's not fully clear, uh, sorry, and don't worry, but like you can check out this paper. It's, um, I think it makes a pretty clear exposition. And all the gates and trapped ions basically follow this state dependent force idea in various ways. So here are some state-of-the-art results for two qubit gates. So the best gates in trapped ions have a fidelity of 99.9%. .9%. This is a result from NIST from 2016. And the time scale is 30 microseconds. Uh, the fastest high fidelity gate is in Oxford 2018. Uh, and it's in 1.6 microseconds, 99.8% fidelity. Um, and one of the startups, IonQ, I think last year, I was just checking their fidelities and they were having 97.5%, which is a bit less, but it is on any two out of 13 qubits, right? So this really illustrates this powerful connectivity that if you think about a superconducting chip, for example, it has some like boring topology, while a trapped ion string is really all to all connected. 
And I suppose that this fidelity, they'll probably announce this year that they get much better and many more queues. So Maciek, just a question. So this last number, is it from some paper or is it from a press release? Of um, I mean, it is from a press release. And it's also what you can like, if you go on like Amazon Cloud, you can run things with this fidelity sure. on their system. But it's not really from a paper, I think, because it's not really that great. <laughs> <laughs> well, so then do you, okay, um, and the because, problem, do you like, imply that they, okay, you go to the cloud, this number like is listed there, but it's really not that great because otherwise it would have been the paper. Or, no, no, I mean, I think that it's not really enough to, they basically took whatever was possible in ion traps and they implement, like, they didn't make any step change to get this result. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think they will have papers once they figure out new tricks of making all of this better. But right now, uh, in trap science at least, the industry is just about caught up with academic groups. Uh, so for example, and typically they also don't really write their fidelities in that much detail. They will talk about this like quantum volume, but then to actually know what the number is is a bit more complicated because some of them have like a, a, not an all to all, but like a mixed connectivity is a bit of a mess. I guess the one thing I wanted to emphasize about the two qubit gates in trapped ions is that they're really well understood. So here is a graph from an Oxford paper in 2016 where they do a 99.9% .9 fidelity gate. The points you see are the measured errors versus gate time. And the black line is the expected error from first principles, right? So basically there's a very simple error model which says, you know, on one hand, if my gate is too fast, I'm limited by photon scattering, so I need a more laser power. If I'm too slow, I'm limited by the magnetic field noise. And that's it. And the measured fidelities more or less agree with this error model. Um, and as much as we understand them, I think that the gates will get much better. Um, because unlike other quantum computing fields, we are not at all materials limited, right? There is not like, it's not like in superconducting qubits where like, oh, we have some dephasing let me spend a lot of money trying out all different materials and maybe one of them will deface less. This is really um, as not at all the limit of physics where we are with trapped ions. And in particular, the spin, spin dephasing can be pushed way down by techniques which are pretty simple, yeah. So, but if I understand well, like there is like no matter, I mean, it's, it's good that the noise is understood but like still there is like a uh, well-defined minimum of this, fun uh, of this function, it seems, right? So it cannot get better than this. Yeah, I mean, so this particular gate uh, couldn't get better if you get a more powerful laser or could get better if you have um, lower spin dephasing. So if once they now get the, like put some magnetic shields around the experiment, they'll probably be able to get into this slower, higher fidelity regime around here. Right, okay, so there's just some other parameters that sort of give different care. But, but yeah, but this is only like, there are other gate proposals um, out there which are better suited for making very high fidelity gates. Um, and I think they will work soon uh, because the, the physics of errors is very well understood. But yeah, not in like, this particular graph doesn't let you go much better. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so I guess these are the three pillars, um, the measurements, the trapping, and the uh, logical gates. Are there any questions um, about this before I move on to the fancy new stuff? Uh, so those new ideas for gates, they are all based on this idea that you described to us, like coupling with the motion of the oscillator. Exactly, yeah. So because, because basically you need to couple multiple qubits together. Um, and what you do is that there are many spins, but there is only one oscillator, like all the oscillator modes are shared. So you always use some kind of oscillator coupling and typically the state dependent force, yeah. Any other questions? I have plenty, but maybe later. Okay. <laughs>
All right, so it seems like so far, I, from what I told you, you know, the problem is solved. Now we just trap 1 million ions and we do the Shor algorithm, you know, we go home. But the problem is that you can't really grow ion chains indefinitely without increasing errors. So this is, a, for example, a picture of a spectrum of radial normal modes of nine trapped ions. And you see that there's a lot of peaks, they're very close together. And the problem is that we're doing gates which require us to sort of go close to those modes with the lasers. And then if there are too many ions, the modes could just get too close and um, the problem becomes a bit intractable. So there is no hard limit here, but generally whatever method you have to do gates, if you double the number of ions, the gates will get worse. So it's not a scalable way of expanding your computational space. So people, gen yeah? Is it like people, kind of proved that it's impossible or like, is there like some, uh, I mean, okay, on the physics side, like intuitively I understand that, okay, like if you're messing with those other energy levels, then you're in trouble, but like maybe by some uh, funny control of this oscillator yeah. mode or whatever. That's a good question. So of course, so there's a lot of work on, you know, numerical optimization for of gates given your normal mode spectrum. Mm -hmm. And there are generally two things that happen, right? So one thing is that you need to take care of all the modes that you excite off resonantly. And the more modes there is, the more, the longer the pulse you need to make to sort of decouple all of them. Uh, so that's one thing that comes out of numerics. And the second thing is that whatever error you have, so for example, you might have some error associated with the um, drifts of those frequencies. And this error, as you increase the number of modes, it increases and eventually it starts lim uh, decreasing your fidelity. So, gen like, so also from this point of view, like you can, if you can do, if you can keep some error small for some number of ions, in general, when you increase the number of ions, the same error will get larger. And there is no, but there's no hard limit. So people typically work for quantum information purposes, maybe with 30, 40, 50 in a row, max. And, but not really more. So you see some papers like this, where for example, it's from a Monroe group in 2016, where they show that they can do, they can trap 121 ions in a cryogenic trap over days. But then if you look up their, pa their subsequent papers about quantum information, they never do it with 121 ions. They always do it with 30, right? And they don't tell you what happens with the remaining ions, but the answer is it was just too annoying to work with them, too complicated, so we didn't do it. So generally speaking, you can have some number on the order of 100 that you can work with once, but then you need to get more chains rather than having one longer chain to expand this. And the main proposal about how to do it how to finish up this construction is called the quantum CCD architecture. It was actually already proposed in 2002 by Dave Kilpinski in NIST and Dave Weinland. And the idea here is that basically you have some big chip with lots of ions. And basically you have some like string of ions here, string of ions here, string of ions there. You do your computations on them and then you connect them by basically moving ions from one place to another. So maybe you can entangle two ions here and then take one, move it over there, and entangle it here. So that's one of the ways in which we envision making trapped ions bigger, right? Maybe you even make traps with dedicated zones. So here you optimize everything for best gates, and then when you detect, you maybe move this ion, blah, 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 and you read it out here where you have a uh, detector. So that's a general idea, and people have been working towards it, but it's very challenging from many, many points of reasons. And I'll tell you about some. But what I want to tell you about, which is my work, is actually the problem of scalable laser delivery. So the problem is like this, right? So in a normal ion trap experiment, we have some chip with some ions. We align some laser beams at those ions. And then, you know, ideally we have some lasers which we have for individual addressing. So we can address this ion or this ion with the red laser. But now, how do you address how do you aim 1 million laser beams or 1 million ions the, uh, in the vacuum system in a way that addresses them individually? You can't. So our solution has been to 
has been like this. So this is a side view of a trapped ion experiment. So now there is an ion trapped above a chip, some laser from the sides. We take away the laser beams and we put them in an optical fiber. And we bring this optical fiber to the side of the chip. And inside the chip, we make waveguides for our lasers, such that now the light goes from the fiber, in, enters the waveguide, travels through the waveguide and hits a diffraction grating, and then diffracts out to hit the correct ion. So actually what we work with in the lab looks like this. We have one laser beam, which we split into many fibers, and we can individually pulse each fiber. And then those fibers enter the vacuum system and enter from the side of the trap. So this is our ion trap. It's also a chip. It, you just see yellow because it's all gold. But if you had X-ray vision, you'd see that basically there is a waveguide going from each fiber into a separate place on the chip. So if you zoom in, it looks like this. So here you see some electrodes, which we use to put voltages on, right, to trap ions. And then there are three zones where we trap ions. And next to each ion, you see two holes, right? And these are openings for those laser beams to come out of the chip. So if you zoom in even further, this is what it looks like. So you see basically the ion, the, the light enters from this waveguide here, expands out, hits a diffraction grating, and then diffracts out of the plane of the image to hit, hit the ion. And by making a bigger grating, we can have a small spot. Sorry, I, I, I miss the, like the reason of the diffraction grading. It seems like some fancy, very ingenious experimental idea, but like why? Uh, so, right. yeah, no, so we want to, we have all this light that goes inside the chip and then we need to bring it up at some point. Um, and you know, in, in the, um, in those like found commercial like CMOS foundries, everything is planar. So you can't take a waveguide and just kind of root it up. Everything needs to be defined basically in a plane. So the best way for us to make the beam come out was to define a diffraction grating, which has the correct period such that it only allows the light at this one specific angle to come out. Uh, nice. And actually there's another beam that diffracts down, reflects off the silicon, and gets coherently amplified with this one and also goes up. Ah. Fancy. Fancy, that was our secret sauce. And so actually we can measure the spot that we get from this. If we look from above, you basically get a spot like six times three microns. This is very small as far as trap panels experiments go, but not as small as physically possible. We actually deliberately made it larger such that we have one spot which we can use to illuminate two ions, sort of in these two positions, so that we can drive a two qubit gate with one laser beam, just for this demonstration. So this is what the device actually looks like. So here you see from the side the fibers that enter, and they are like butt coupled into this chip, and then they travel underneath the chip and come up. And this chip is glued onto a PCB and wire bonded onto it these little gold wires to deliver electrical connections. So I will not talk about, you know, too much in detail. If you want to read our paper, you can read it. I will just tell you some highlights. So basically, first of all, we show that we can do all the single qubit stuff, mainly that we can make this cryogenic attachment of the fibers to the chip with good efficiency and that we have low crosstalk. So we can put light in a wrong fiber and see that we cannot really drive Rabi flops in other zones, right? And then interestingly, we also find that doing connections this way improves coherence of our operations because it removes the beam pointing fluctuations associated with aiming laser beams from far away. And then we demonstrate that we can do two qubit gates. So hopefully this kind of graph is not familiar. This is the gate I showed you. And you see that there's a theory and like data which matches. And we can do some simple tomography to find that we can create bell states with 99.3% fidelity, which is less than the best gate I showed you. But we do actually understand the 0.6% error. Um, and I think we can improve it. So what's the error? I mean, what are the kinds of problems that we're working on in the lab? 
about half of the error is, is boring. It's to do with things like our laser noise or our cooling, like the kind of things that we could get better if we really wanted to have a best fidelity gate. But about half of the error is uh, weird and it's to do with our chip, to, to do with how we made it. And there are a lot of things here. So just to give you one example. So in order to allow the light to go from the waveguide onto the ion, we have to make holes in those electrodes on top. But that means that the ion sees all of this dielectric, this basically glass. And now what can happen is that every time we shine a laser beam, we charge up this dielectric and this charge slightly disturbs the potential, the electrical potential that the ion sees. So we believe that this is what causes our emotional frequency drifts, which contribute to the errors of the gates. And the kind of solution that we now have for the next run of the fabrication is to put a small layer of a transparent conductor. So there are some materials which are metals, but are transparent. And then we can close the gap inside the electrode and still allow the laser beam to come out. So this is the kind of thing that we're fabricating now. And we hope that this will help with this error. And then we have this other error of emotional heating, which through a different way, we also hope we can get rid of. So let's see where this goes, but hopefully it will work. And I think this is a very interesting field of this like integration of integrated optics and atomic physics. So what are the obvious next steps? Well, one step is to integrate all lasers because I haven't told you, but you remember there is this laser that we use for detection to, that we scatter photons on. And actually that's a blue laser and the waveguide material we're using now doesn't transmit blue light. So we actually still put this laser beam, not through the waveguide, but through free space. But there are like better materials that we can use and we'll try to use them such that we can put this light through the waveguide. And I get basically something like this where there are multiple waveguides aimed at one spot to deliver all the light to the eye. And once we can do that, we can also collect light through the waveguide. So right now we have this big lens I showed you and a detector that collects all the fluorescence, but we could just plug a photo detector to the fiber and collect light like this. And if we do both of those things, we'll basically have a fully integrated trap. So then you can really, you know, completely change the way trapped ions are developed because you can, you know, you will be able to quickly manufacture them, quickly test them, this many in parallel and so on. And it will allow this field to scale through the same techniques that are common in like microelectronics and optics. So I think this is exciting. But enough about optical integration. I want to finish with highlighting some other challenges of the field. So challenge number one, complete dual species operation. So what do I mean by this? Well, if you're a theorist, you probably think of quantum information in this terms, where you have some logical qubit, some ancillas, you entangle the ancillas with the logical qubit and you measure them. However, the way of measurement that I showed you before doesn't really work in this way. Because suppose that I have many ions in the trap and now say this is my ancilla, I want to measure the ancilla. But if the ancilla is measured, it emits all those photons and one of those photons can hit the logical ions and sort of measure them, so cause some decoherence. And that's a big problem. And the solution for this is to use two different ion species. So basically use one ion as ancilla and one ion as logical qubit, such that the light that we use to measure the ancilla is off resonant with the logical ions and doesn't decohere them at all. And that's something that's already been done. So this, for example, results from a couple of years ago from my lab, where there is this parity measurement. So we have logical information coded in two beryllium ions, and the ancilla is one calcium ion. And we can entangle them and then measure the calcium ion without decohering the berylliums. And they were even able to show that they can then do some like active feedback. So depending on the measurement result, you do some correction on the beryllium or not, right? Um, but the challenging thing was making good fidelity entanglement between different species because it's not as easy. You still use state dependent forces, but it's harder. <laughs> Just recently, there was a paper from Oxford where they first, for the first time, managed a really high fidelity gate with two different ion species. So 99.8% between strontium and calcium. 
And I think an obvious step is to combine um, this fidelity with this kind of system to really start doing something like that resembles error correction. Um, but still keeping diff a lot of species, so two different species and many ions in one trap in a very controlled way is a little bit challenging and not many groups can do that. Okay, challenge number two is to have parallel operations in zones connected by junctions. So I showed you this QCCD architecture where we have many zones and so on. And people have done similar things, but not really. So I think the most advanced experiment along those lines is from this year from NIST, where they have a trap like this, where they have one experiment zone and this junction. And they can basically moving ions through junctions is hard. <laughs> so what they can just about do is they can trap a bunch of ions here and then move them through the junction to reorder them. <laughs> so it's very nice and they can, you know, do it with, and then they can do some experiments to show that in this process, they don't lose with the quantum information. But what you really want to do is something like this, where you have a big trap with many zones and they have, and you can do things in parallel in different zones and then, you know, move ions between the zones in a sort of a reasonable way. But that hasn't really been done yet. So actually, I think many people expected this was gonna be done by now. This was a paper, this was a trial that was made in NIST over 10 years ago. And they expect that this is gonna be it, but actually it really misbehaved. So there is this nice quote from the paper, which says, transport between two of the junctions seems technically feasible, but practically difficult because of the need for continual adjustment of the waveform to compensate for time varying char charging fields. Um, so there are a lot of work in the last decade to basically make something that looks like this trap, but performs well. And it's both on the fabrication side to make better traps, which have junctions and on the control side. So I think now a lot with like machine learning to really transport ions. Um, it's a very hard like optimization problem, uh, both to design and uh, to the trap and to design the waveforms to move the ions around. There's a lot of unknowns in the fabrication and everything. And I think with machine learning, it's gonna get a bit better. Challenge number three, integration of optical cavities. So I showed you the before that this is the way we, like when an ion emits fluorescence, we have some lens that collects it, but it only collects a little bit, maybe like a few percent. And that limits the speed of measurements and also limits the speed of interactions. What we would like to do is instead have an ion in an optical cavity to enhance the emission along this direction. And this will allow us to collect almost all the photons and also make all the gates faster. Um, and, and allow, you know, bell state, teleportation, all kinds of stuff like this. So again, this is one of these examples of things that I think many people thought is going to be done by now, but it's not. Finally, this year, there was a paper from Sussex which demonstrated an ion in an ion trap, which is strongly coupled to an optical cavity. So the cavity here was formed by those two optical fibers, but you know, it's not really scalable because you can have one such cavity in a trap, but not many. What you really want is some kind of a trap with an integrated cavity, where, which you can replicate. And this is something that a few groups are working towards. Um, one reason to do this is networking. So there was an experiment in Oxford last year where they just have two ions in different traps. They collect the photons these ions emit and they do a bell state measurement to entangle these two ions in different traps. And they can do this with very good fidelity in 5.5 milliseconds on average, which is, you know, it's okay, but it's slow. However, they only collect 2% of the photons because they just have a big lens. If they could do this experiment with cavities where they can collect, you know, 100% photons or maybe even enhance this rate of photon emission, well, now you're talking about heralded entanglement that can happen in, in tens of microseconds. And now you can really think of this quantum computation in a more networked fashion. And this can really be a part of a quantum computer. So these are the three challenges that I, the field is facing right now and I'm looking forward to people solving. Let me finish off with some predictions. So personal predictions for the next few years. I think that 
trap piles will be the most useful NISC platform. And um, I think that someone will soon figure out how to do entangling gates with 99.99% fidelity, and that they will get this basic quantum CCD architecture running with 100 qubits or so. Now, 100 qubits may not be too many um, compared to what maybe superconducting guys will achieve, but I think that you can really leverage this powerful conducti connectivity, both in terms of being able to entangle not just nearest neighbors and the transport. As an example, there was a recent paper from Sussex, which compares the quantum volume for a given error rate of, um, that you get for all-to-all -all connectivity and for nearest neighbor interactions, like with superconducting qubits. And basically for the same errors and for the same number of qubits, you can really like enhance the quantum volume by an order of magnitude or even two orders of magnitude by having ions which are transported around uh, zones. And these are all done with you know, reasonable error rates and so on. So I think that for these kinds of small scale systems, this powerful connectivity combined with high fidelities will make trap ions really useful. I am a bit less certain about fault tolerant quantum computing, to be honest. And the reason is that speed is everything and trapped ions are slow. So I showed you that the best fidelity gates, they happen in 10 microseconds, maybe 100. And this is generally three orders of magnitude slower than superconducting qubits. And superconducting qubits are already slow if you, uh, you know, in a fault tolerant fashion. Now there is some gain from better connectivity, but I'm not sure if it's really enough to offset those errors. And I think this is a graph that I like from an old paper from Roy Van Meter, which looks at the runtime of an ideal Shor algorithm versus the clock speed of your quantum computer. And you basically see if you want to factor 1000 bits, you know, your algorithm, your quantum computer outperforms the classical one. But a megahertz clock quantum computer takes 100 seconds to do it, whereas a one hertz quantum computer takes 10 years. Okay, so this green line is practical. This yellow line is impractical. And the trapped ions will be somewhere in between. And, you know, the question is where? Um, now, if you look at this, this line, this shows you the difference that you get from arbitrary connectivity. So the solid line is for nearest neighbor connections and the, the dashed line is for arbitrary connected qubits. So you do get some gain from larger connectivity, but you know, trap ions are not arbitrarily connected. They're just more connected than superconducting qubits, but not all to all. Um, so this is one graph they like that shows you the challenge, but this graph only works with ideal gates. Now error correction is a whole different game. And so this is a paper from 10 years ago from some serious like people who really try to optimize the runtime of trapped ion algorithms. And this is the result. So they take some realistic slash optimistic errors for trapped ion quantum computers and find that in order to factor 1000 bits with Scholl algorithm, it takes 10 to the nine seconds. Now 10 to nine seconds is a big number. It's something like, one million days or one million years. Well, that doesn't matter. It's one million of some unit, which is high. Um, so it's clearly not there yet in terms of like having worked it out. And, you know, there's a lot of things, if this is ever to be a practical fault tolerant quantum computer, a lot of things need to happen on the conceptual side and on the hardware side. So I think on the conceptual side, we need better quantum error correction codes something that leverages this high connectivity, but doesn't require the, all to, the global connectivity of a typical concatenated code. And then really minimizes the fault tolerance overhead. So the reason that this, you know, this, in this algorithm here, 80% of time is just spent preparing ancillas fault tolerantly. And that's where the time goes. So if you can tackle that, that's how you make gains. And there's a lot of interesting work recently, you know, on this like, sub-single shot, fault tolerant stabilizer readouts or like flag qubits, like all of this and more will be needed if trapped ions are gonna be a practical quantum computer or if anything is gonna be a, a practical quantum computer. And on the hardware side, 
you know, we need faster operations. If we can integrate the cavities and really gain a factor of 10 in clock speeds, this would really go a long way. And we need to make this transport and we need to have it fast. And we need to make the optical links ideally and also have them fast. And finally, I said that I expect to see a 99.99% gate, but really you need to go lower because if you now think of the non-surface codes, they tend to have error thresholds, which are you know, 10 to minus four, 10 to minus five, and they only become practical around 10 to minus six. So we, we have to also push this number now. Okay, yes, yeah, so I'm happy to talk about this all in detail. Here's a summary of the talk. We discussed the three pillars of ion trapping. So, so of quantum computing with trap time. So there is a trapping of ions, which we do with the oscillating fields and we get to about 100 ions in one zone. Then I told you about this fluorescent readout, which is a state dependent fluorescence, which gets us errors of one in negative three or one in negative four in tens or hundreds of microseconds. And then finally, I talked about the logic gates, which are mediated by the harmonic oscillator and by the state dependent force. And then state of the art fidelities are one in negative three errors in tens or hundreds of microseconds. And then I showed you our work, our integrated photonics, where we bring the light directly to the ions underneath the chip. And finally, I highlighted what a future ion trap might look like and some problems of getting there. So before I finish, I want to acknowledge um, the people that work with me and taught me all this stuff. So there's a group at ETH. We now also have a theory wing, if you guys are interested, uh, thinking a lot about uh, dissipative stuff. And in particular, the people who did the integrated optics work. So my postdoc, Karen Mehta, and my fellow PhD student, Chi Zhang. So now before I finish, all those people are the people who yeah, work with me, but I wouldn't be here um, without the people who uh, volunteer their time to teach physics to random high schoolers. So as, as uh, I dug out this photo, as Michal mentioned, from 2011, um, so somehow, yeah, Michal really was like volunteer hundreds of hours of hundreds of hours of his own time to just like teaching people physics for you know no apparent benefit to his own. So I think I wouldn't be here also without him. So for once, I will also put you in the acknowledgments. So yeah, thanks guys. And uh, if you have any questions, we can talk now. Um, thanks, Magic, for a very nice talk and. Okay, I'm flattered. I mean, you exaggerate, of course, but yeah. So now it's time for, for questions, comments, guys. Please, Michal. Can uh, I, uh, sure, Michal, please go ahead. Uh, so I, I, hi, it was a super nice talk. I ex really <coughs> excited. I mean, it was lots of pleasure. I have a question, I would say maybe too experimental as for the other audience, but, uh, but I'm just wondering about, I mean, I have two questions. So one question is about the, uh, and, uh, I, um, about initialization of the ions, like production of them, because it's kind of a yeah. messy process. So I, yeah. I know how it's done with the like single or few, I mean, the standard standard experiments. But the question is if you want to use it on the chip, yeah. so how to produce many of them and to make it like uh, in a deterministic way? Yeah. This software? Yeah, so I think, yeah, so maybe I should say for everybody the standard process of um, getting the qubits. Maybe I even have a slide that had my horrible handwriting on it. So the standard process of getting qubits, as you say, is a bit messy. So what we have is that we have our ion trap and we have some um, place with some ion atoms, right? And we heat it up to create a lot of vapor. So there's like an oven. And then we have some ions that fly through the trap. And when an ion flies through the trap, we hit it with a laser which has the right energy to kick out one electron. And now that we kick out this electron, we are just left with a single ion in the trap. And now it feels the trap and it is confined there. So this process is a little bit messy. Part of the messiness comes from the fact that this vapor here, for example, can coat the trap and create some extra charges, right? So I think that for a deterministic production, I would look into two things. So one, one thing that some groups do, um, actually one group does, is to use a MOT, like a magneto-optical trap, where they first, uh, in a separate vacuum chamber, where they uh, prepare basically already cold, cold atoms, 
And then they basically, they can shuttle a very small number across to the, the ion trap and very deterministically ionize it. So this, um, and the, the efficiency there is very high because the source is already very cold. Um, but then you really probably want to have a big chip where you do this in one place and then you bring the ions when needed to a different place when you detect ion loss, right? And another trick that people do is that they make chips which have holes that basically this vapor comes from the back of the chip, comes through the hole, and then it only coats the back of the chip instead of the places where you actually care about the voltages. So I think these are the, the best two tricks I know of, of producing them cleanly. Okay, but still they don't sound as kind of iPhone friendly that you can put it in the kind of, uh, let's say, really integrated, uh, I mean, for the scientific reasons, yes, but... but yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, because I think that in the yeah, second nature... Not, that's a limit. It's a problem, yeah. Because I think in the second nature from this year, that the, that the nature that you mentioned where they had the all lasers integrated, they also had yeah. the ionization laser, but they didn't also have like, I, I don't, like, this is the question, I don't know. Yeah. So they also didn't propose some kind of how to, how to skip this, this, I mean, how to solve this initial problem, right? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, so actually, okay. in this experiment, they use this called moth source for their ions, ah, okay. Um, okay. which I think is right now regarded as state of the art. Yes. And yeah, so I mentioned this, <laughs> this was the, this, the Nature paper that was also recently together with us about integrating all lasers. Um, I mean, they really didn't use any new materials, they just sort of picked up the correct ion that just about you can squeeze a little bit of this light through. Um, but yeah, no, the, the deterministic ion loading process is a bit annoying, but okay, so here's another idea. Like another example is to have an ion trap where you load ions, which is dirty, and then you sort of ballistically throw them onto your nice clean chips. But yeah, it's, it's a vacuum, it's definitely sort of a big vacuum system with a lot of tubes rather than like, the foundry of Intel. <laughs> so, so or not. Can, can I have one more short maybe question? Of course, um, we have such a distinguished guest. No. Go ahead. So my, my second question will, would be about exactly about quality of the vacuum because I mean that there is always something in the vacuum. There is some hydrogen, there is some can be some CO2 from the from the ion pumps or something like this. Yeah. And the question is, is this problematic at all for you? Or because I don't know, the, the collision yeah. probably happens every few seconds, three minutes, I, this I don't know. So the yeah, question so is, I think, so, so, so it's a good question. So for me personally, it's a problem, but it's a problem for me personally, because when I made this system, I didn't really know too much about the vacuum. I think the state of the art example that is here, okay? So this is a deep sort of cryogenic trap um, with over 100 ions. And they do find that they get a collision. Um, so when you really optimize your vacuum in cryogenic environments at 4 Kelvin, um, they do get a collision every few hours. So not very often. So actually here in the, there is this arrow pointing to a dark ion, which is just collided with something. But they say that this collision doesn't cause the loss. So after a few milliseconds, this ion comes back to being bright. So it doesn't disappear and they don't measure any loss. Now that's true for ions for traps with one species. Now when you have two different, like a dual species trap, people have all the kinds of nightmare stories where some collision comes and then there is some parametric instability in the, because of the different masses of the two different ions and something gets lost. So for multiple species, I believe it's not under control. <laughs> but you know, in CERN, they can trap a single anti-hydrogen, right? They can switch off their trap and it stays there for months. So yes, I think yes. that's like, tells us how good the vacuum can be. <laughs> yes, okay, so thank you very much, it was very good. Yeah, so if you have some problems with collisions, you can, I'm, I'm interested in this messy part of these collisions, so okay. I can always. Okay, we can talk. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Uh, I have some. Uh, could you go to the uh, like one slide before the last one? Mm. When you've got a summary of the numbers. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. Here? 
uh, now the next one. Um, yeah, here, like, because you here put the numbers, which I forgot already. Uh, like, just by looking at the speed of the stuff here, right? When you have yeah. the readout. So, from those numbers, it follows that uh, the bottleneck as of now is readout, right? Not really, uh, no. I no? mean, ah, okay, because, because you need to have a lot of gates, right? Uh, that's because very, it's very it's because it's very parallel. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. The bottom, uh, I think, yeah. for the compilations that I've seen is that in order to um, fault tolerantly read out stabilizers, you need to prepare some very funky, like, um, I don't know, cat states of ancillas, of like many of them, and that takes a long, long time. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But you know everything is in a so the time scale for us is a megahertz, and it's really hard in ion traps to do something faster than a microsecond. Yeah, so, so that's, that's exactly crazy. kind of like how, uh, what I wanted to ask, like because uh, you say that the ion traps are slow, and like the question is whether it can really be mitigated, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. using engineering only or... Yeah, uh, so I think there are... So let me tell you about the physics of this time limit. Mm -hmm. So one limit is in megahertz and that's in the um, trap potential. So the oscillator frequencies are in the megahertz. You can push it a bit if you apply higher voltages, but probably nobody has really pushed it below above, you know, a few megahertz. It might, it, there is not stability there. Um, and basically, if you want to do anything on the oscillator, you need to usually wait until it does some oscillation. The, the, there are some gates which perform, which go faster than this by using very fast, ultra fast pulsed lasers. And then the limit is like, then the next limit, is the rate of ion-photon interactions, basically. So for example, if you think about the readout, the state which is excited takes seven nanoseconds to decay. So maybe the, the, hard, the ultimate limit of how fast you can do detection is seven nanoseconds. <laughs> yeah, makes uh, sense. So that's like the next time scale. But so far, it's been a painful journey putting the gate times to microsecond, I, I doubt it will really get faster than this. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, any further questions? Uh, have you come across, uh, so like at some point in your talk, like I, you, you, used the, you, you said something about better error correction codes. So mm -hmm. as, as far as I understand, like most of quantum error correction is study, it's sort of studied in a hardware agnostic manner. So, I mean, for instance, you mentioned you, uh, like, you know, these flat qubits. Now, flat qubits are probably like some small example where you would find, let's say, hardware-specific uh, design. But would you say that it's like true? I mean, I'm asking your opinion in some sense that... Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm not an expert on this, but my feeling is that it's hardly agnostic. So, I mean, if you look at quantum error corrections, half of the things are in surface codes. And they are very tailored to having um, nearest neighbor interactions. Um, and then if you look at, for example, the, uh, yeah, so that, that is not, that, uh, that, that's very hardware specific. And then there is this other hardware agnostic part where you just think about error steam code and concatenation and so on. And that's sort of very hardware unrealistic because it assumes generally global interactions. They're, they don't put any limit on which entanglement can happen, which two qubits can be connected any time step. Um, so I think that well, what I meant to say is that I would like to see something like some work which is like, um, like the surface code, so sort of uh, architecture specific, but is does but goes above nearest neighbor interactions or nearest neighbor interactions in a few dimension. Because I think there is no way to um, run, like I think surface code is out of question for ion traps, just because of its speed. Actually, you, you can even argue that surface code is like a 
was invented to make superconducting qubits as slow as trapped ions. So just a comment here. I mean, of course, this kind of codes are not realistic, but like there are those fancy uh, codes like constructed in hyperbolic spaces or whatever, and like the corresponding connectivity is of course insane, right? Yeah. But they are of course probably not constructed because of feasibility for the ion trap. Yeah, and it also sort of. I mean, there are I think some like wacky codes out there, but. The question of decoding errors is also really pretty hard, right? And it's easier to come up with an error correcting code. You, yeah, once you come up with an error correcting code, it might be not possible to efficiently decode errors. And that's also, of course, a challenge. Right. I know that we are like way over time, but I have one more question. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. uh, actually, uh, recently there there is a bunch of like algorithms or or, or routines in the in this near term regime that require let's say uh, frequent frequent changes of settings of your gaze or measurement. Okay, like mm -hmm. quick adaptation of your circuit, so to say, maybe yeah. in some simple way. How feasible this part is for? Uh, yeah, actually, I think it's pretty good, and I think it's even there is some reason why it's easier in trapped ions than other things. So, if you, for example, check out this paper from 2018, um, where they do, I mean, you know, we can adapt, we can we can do fast operations adaptively based on um, you know readouts even within the circuit, and. So you remember that trapped ions have long coherence times, right? So you can have a hardware which takes, for example, some results, does some calculations, and then does some conditional operations. And this thing can actually be pretty slow. Maybe, I don't mean, you know, seconds, but I mean tens of microseconds. Um, and then, and the ions will still not have decohered. So you can do some like funky, I know it works about like Bayesian phase estimation and so on, which do this in trapped ions. Now the problem is way more challenging in superconducting qubits because they need to read out, get the signals out of the fridge, which takes, and there they're limited by the speed of light. <laughs> then they need to do some computation in a few nanoseconds, which is also barely possible. And then they need to bring the signal back to the cryogenic environment. And there will be a lot of decoherence in the meantime. That's why, for example, the ability to do a mid in the middle of the circle, the measurement is not usually there in like IBM systems, right? Right. And also, if you think about like photonic platforms, it is really a problem, right? That you need to do everything and you need to have your electrons moving faster than your photons. <laughs> and that's, so I think, you know, in the end, in the fault tolerant regime, Speed is a benefit, but for now, atomic platforms, the fact that they're slow means that they're easier <laughs> to do this kind of thing that you, you talk about. <laughs> cool, thanks. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, so thank you, everybody. And if you uh, want to talk about it more, if you have any questions, um, you can write me an email, and I'll be happy to uh, chat about any of this stuff. Many thanks, Maciek, for your time, and great talk.